I'm Brian Jeems. I'm the network manager for University of Idaho. And uh, I uh, prepared some uh, slides to uh, talk about how, how we think about network monitoring and the tools that we use with network monitoring. I, uh, I, I don't mind to get questions uh, as we go through, uh, but I also am uh, fine to just kind of keep going at a pace. And then if we have time left or at the end, we can dive into specific examples, questions, or discussion is kind of how I was thinking about using the time. Uh, let me make sure I'm watching the chat here. Uh, I've got that up and running. Uh, and maybe, you know, I don't have a sense of who all's in the room, uh, uh, how many people are there, and, uh, you know, how many of you are doing network monitoring, have tools, raise your hand if you already have, you know, if that's part of your job, doing network monitoring and you have a set of tools. Okay, so I'm seeing maybe half the people, third of the people. Okay, great. Well, good to see you all. Thank you for the camera work there. Uh, that way I'm, no, I have, I'll try to remember who I'm talking to. But yeah, please uh, speak up or put something in the chat uh, uh, if there's someone in the room managing chat and uh, I'll try to see one of those and stop and answer questions. Well, I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Oh, and maybe I should ask one more thing. It looks, it sounds like you can hear me okay. I'm coming through okay. Great. I see heads nodding, thanks. All right, so the, uh, is that, how's the resolution on this slide? That look okay? Good, yeah, good. Great, thanks. Okay. So I, here's how I think about network monitoring categories. I, I kind of uh, break them into three different groups. There's the operational focus, which is your largely your real-time alerting, situational awareness. How are we doing? Do we have a problem? Then there's the planning category of that's keeping a history. So we can look back and say, hey, are, you know, has our traffic increasing, decreasing? You know, what trends do we have going on out there? And then there are the performance uh, monitors that um, to me, I really focus on the end-to-end -end monitors, uh, especially in the world that uh, we're moving into with service providers and, and both for cloud, for hosting of services, as well as you know, just service providers providing last mile or Metro Ethernet type services. We need end-to-end -end measures because some part of the network that we're monitoring is a black box to us. So those are my three big categories. And this is really also the agenda for the talk where I just plan to go through each one of these items. I've listed for each uh, type of activity, the tools that we use. We, we use a combination of homegrown tools, open source tools and licensed commercial off the shelf tools. So, uh, you know, uh, being in higher ed, we have a, we, put a high value on being frugal and so uh, if we're if we're paying for a tool it's it's because it's a really good tool and if we can uh, find a tool that is an open source tool that we can manage ourselves we'll put the time and energy into that and and use that and a lot of times that's what i explain to our vendors what you're competing against isn't the other competitors in the market what you're competing against is what it would take for my team to build a tool or find an open source tool and run it ourselves. So uh, you need to, you know, that's that's what they have to do to be competitive and win our business in, in the tool space. So the other thing I wanted to talk as, as a high level, uh, kind of our principles, our goals with network monitoring, number one is to detect, you know, the to be a good network manager, a good network team, you don't want to be using your customers, your users as the outage detectors and the problem detectors. Uh, they'll let you know, uh, you know, uh, and it, it may be on Twitter or, or uh, TikTok or something, or it may, you know, they'll call you. But ideally, we want to have the right tools in place. So we're detecting the problems before the customers notice, ideally, or at least two, that we at least know that there's a problem when they call us. So by the time they're calling us and contacting us, we know, oh yeah, 
I can see you have a problem here. Uh, we see it on our graphs. We see it in our alerts. So, uh, and and but where possible, we want to know ahead of time. We try to look for those early indicators. Users aren't seeing it yet, but there's a little bit of packet loss here or something. We need to take action. And then lastly, for the historical data, is we need to see the bigger trends, the bigger patterns. At times, there there are things where you know this this sounds familiar. Did this didn't this happen last week? Didn't it happen last month? Uh, you know, and so having that historical record and being able to go back, or sometimes you get a user that says, I had a problem last Wednesday, you know, but they don't tell you until this week. And so if you don't have that history, you have a hard time going back and saying, yeah, we saw that issue and we resolved it, or it's been resolved, or, you know, you don't want to be in the position of saying, wow, we have no idea what happened last week. Sorry. <laughs> So I'm going to dive right into the tools. What I've done is to kind of be, uh, you know, not lower risk. I've got screenshots in here. I thought it would also be more useful for uh, if, if uh, people wanted copies of the presentation. I can provide those later to have them in the slides. But at the end, if we have time left over and there's interest in seeing any of these tools, you know, as more of a live demo, I'm happy to dig into some of those. But for, for the main part of the presentation, I'm, I'm just going to talk through uh, the static images I have here. So number one in real-time alerting, we have our homegrown NMS. We also use Nagios for a few things. Our server team uses Nagios extensively. And there are some things our homegrown NMS doesn't do. And so uh, for specific SNMP variables or or other monitors that Nagios has that we, you know, it doesn't make sense to build ourselves, we, we use it. But 99% of what we monitor in terms of SNMP and ping polling to kind of down detect when something's down and alert us, we have over 4,000 devices in our NMS system. So here's, a, here's what that page looks like with all the devices, whether we're polling it, whether we're, oh yeah, I should be pointing with my pointer, not my hand, here we go. Can you see the pointer? I don't know if you can. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, and we made this tabular format because this time of year, a lot's happened over the summer. A lot of things have been, buildings have been under maintenance. So we disable a lot of alerting and then start of the fall semester, we don't want to go in and not know, not be being alerted about things yeah, for the start of the semester. So we have this where we know, yeah, we're pulling it, we're alerting on it, or it's suspended what the uptime is, and we get a kind of a green uh, or red status on each of those and uh, or grayed out if it's not uh, available. And then we also have a log view of this as well. And this goes into our central logging in Splunk, but it's also available just through our NMS system. Uh, it was has always been there. So we also get other useful information in here about, yeah, things. This is from last night. We were, I was up late. Uh, we were doing some uh, network upgrades uh, in preparation for start of the semester. We had an unexpected issue with one of our border routers. So it was failing pings. Uh, we also, you know, have a UPS here that is in a bad battery state. So this is part of that yeah, we're not going to alert out on the, or there's a different type of alert that I'll show later, but we're not going to alert from this tool on these, but it is collecting information. Hey, it's out there talking to these devices. It's logging it. Then it's going into our central logging. We can do other types of alerts on that. So this is, this is the, you know, what's up gold is a classic one. I don't know if, uh, you know, people want to pop out with it, any of what your favorite tool is, but this should be fairly seen this before. This is what you would expect. I'm going to advance. So the, the next one I started to allude to is we've got Splunk. It's expensive, but it's been, you know, we've been able to justify it just because of the versatility and value we get out of it, uh, at least till now. Uh, you know, we, we keep revisiting it, whether we can keep affording licensing on it or if we need to just there's some things we just can't afford to send it to Splunk and we find other places to log it but uh, we like it because it's become central to our real-time alerting it's got this great uh, filtering capability like uh, you know we've got over a hundred operational alerts defined just for the network team in Splunk I gave a sample 
you know, middle of the page there of just the different type. We try to give them names that mean something to the to the network team. And they're just things that, hey, you know, these are problems. Usually we create these. Yeah, they're created after the fact. We didn't go through and say, oh, I think there will be a hundred th different things we need to be alerted on. These are things that we got surprised. We didn't detect any other way, but they were in the logs. You know, the, these systems are really logging a lot of useful information about the state. They're also logging a bunch of stuff that is just informational. So our goal is if we create an alert for it, it's something that requires action. And if we've been burned on it before, that one of our uh, after incident uh, activities is to say, Oh, I'm going to move. I keep looking to the side to, to look at the group uh, there. I'll move that. I'll move that over to where I can see it a little easier. But uh, if we've been burned on it before, we're going to create as, as part of our after incident, we will. Sorry, I should have turned off my phone. I think it's just ringing in my ear, but it's it's very distracting. I'm going to shut down my Jabber app. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, I'm back back with you. The Yeah, so if we've been burned on it before, it's an after incident follow-up item. Can we create a Splunk alert for this? If it was something in the logs that we eventually went and looked at the logs more in that historical mode of how did this problem happen and we didn't detect it before the customers noticed it. A lot of times it's in the logs. So that's where these hundred uh, alerts came from. It's got, you know, Splunk's got this, if you haven't used it, it's it's great in terms of being able to search just kind of grep style. You know, I think of it like a Unix grep uh, through the logs. And then it's got this alert schedule. I just showed a part of the screen here where you can put it on a schedule. Uh, you know, some of them we do hourly, some of them we do weekly, some of them we do uh, every five minutes, just depending on how quickly we want to know about it in order to take action in a timely fashion. These we just send out via email. Uh, we do have a mechanism where that we can convert that into a, an alert, but usually these are the kinds of things we're gonna react to during business hours. So we're gonna see that come in in our email to the team. So that's another type of real-time alerting. And that's been one we rely on heavily and now, yeah, you know, we consider Splunk a mission critical application for our network operations. Uh, there is uh, other tools. Uh, another tool I'll be talking about later is AKIPS. AKIPS can do a lot of great things. Uh, we love it. Uh, one of the things it can do, it can process uh, syslogs. Now, it's not as nice of an interface for creating alerts, but you can create the same kind of alerts out of AKIPS. So if you can't afford both AKIPS and Splunk, I, you know, if I were put to that as a network manager, I would say, yeah, I'll, I'll do AKIPS and I'll do a little more kind of scripting programming in AKIPS to get this kind of alerting out of the logs. Um, so that's the second item. Now I'll go forward to the third one, which is, uh, you know, what happens when you've got a power outage for half of campus? Uh, or in this case, we were doing a maintenance last night, and we had, you know, 129 uh, here in the middle of the screen, 129 out of 840 devices were offline at one point. Uh, so this was, in this case, fortunately, it's planned maintenance, but this can happen unplanned, uh, often with a power outage. And that's the point where you go in and you're, you're trying to turn off that pull up proactive alerting as fast as possible, because it's just generating tons of alerts. You already know you have a problem. It, you don't need your pager filled up with alerts. So you turn that off, and then we turn to using AKIPS, and this uh, device availability report is awesome where we can get situational awareness. We can see when things come back online. Uh, here, I clicked on the admin edge. You know, We had this border router that after we re rebooted a piece of core equipment, and then after that, our border router started acting weird. It was a reachable, not reachable, reachable, not reachable. So I, yeah, and I can click on that and I can see like, huh, you know, it, it seems to be down for 18 minutes, 11 minutes, 19 minutes, you know, and then it was down for an hour before we finally resolved the issue. But this is great for seeing how many devices are connect, disconnected, which ones are having issues, what the pattern is. Um, so this is a great tool. Once you're out of the detect mode and you're just needing to figure out 
situational awareness of where to focus your energy and effort and triage, how big the impact is. It's also great for posting outages and having for your after incident reports after the fact where you can say when outages stopped, started, what the scope of the outage was, how long it lasted. So we love AKIPS, highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, the, the other nice thing with AKIPS, I mean, there, that you are impacted by how much storage you have on the server, but unlike Splunk, it, it, it isn't licensed based on volume of data that it's collecting. So AKIPS is, is not cheap, but it also is kind of one price, not, not a growing price like a, like a Splunk type of licensing is. Um, then uh, we, this is a new alert we started in the last 18 months. Uh, an excessive traffic alerting. So this is one, our ASA firewalls are getting a little old and a little more susceptible to heavy scans where it'll really start to impact their um, CPU uh, and capacity. So um, we, we found hey, if we set up alerting so that we get an email like this out of AKIPS, whoops, I shouldn't have clicked on that. Uh, we get this email out of AKIPS now where, and this is where I say, it can, it can take a look at interface stats in AKIPS and it can send us an email and say, hey, yeah, we've got a threshold of 32 million packets per second, or I forget if this is in, in whatever window, I think it might be a one, either a one minute or a five minute window. But on average, we should be seeing, you know, if we see more than 30 million packets per second, that's you know more than triple what we would normally see. Something's going on, and so we found a really strong correlation to that on our internet connections. So, if any of our internet connections go out of spec by a couple orders of magnitude, uh, we are not a magnitude, but you know by two or three x, that has been a pretty good alert for us. Then we switch and we go into a tool I'll talk more about in the historical reporting, but it is all, it's really good. Then I can go into the Inmon Traffic Sentinel and I can take a look, I can say, okay, at this time at 11, 18 a.m., yeah, I see it in my flow tool. There was a big spike of traffic going out and it was all from this Threads uh, server at the Northwest Knowledge Network. Fortunately, in this case, that it triggered our alert. It was way out of the normal, but this is a research data storage machine periodically. Researchers do come, a lot of researchers come, grab a lot of data out of there. Sometimes they don't, I don't know in this case, did they do it in the most, in some really inefficient way. But basically there are all this, these Google consumers that just came and hammered it and collected a bunch of data. But it gave us something to follow up with the research team. In this case, they confirmed, yeah, that, that was unusual amount of activity, but it was legitimate traffic not a problem, move on. But we have had times where there's just these heavy scanners out there. And as soon as you block them, they move on to somebody else to scan and profile their network. So this gives us the ability to detect it. We haven't moved. The next phase with this one would be to move to automating it. We haven't done that yet, but at least we can detect it. We can follow up and decide to take action uh, rather than this potentially being a precursor, an early warning sign to something much more drastic because a lot of these, they will start scanning you slowly and then they ramp up until they cause you a problem. And this way we've been able to detect them and block them before they get to that ramp up phase of their scan. So maybe I should pause there on the operational. I'm gonna switch to historical. Any questions, comments that people have on the operational topics? Or is that all pretty good stuff? Thumbs up. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you. I'll step into the next one. So planning and historical reporting. So this is one, again, we love AKIPS. We used to have our own 
kind of suite of tools that was pre, you know, it was before the days of cacti, but it, you know, it, it took energy and effort, but it, the price was right to collect stats on every interface, every statistic on every interface on every device. And then we, we used StatSeeker for a while. And then the, um, in the guys that started StatSeeker went off. They sold that company and went off and started this AKIPS company and did an even better job on their second time around of implementing this. And so I just show a few things. These are kind of graphs I look at at least, you know, at least once a week. I, I just look for the trends of here's our internet, main internet, commodity internet link. Yeah, you know, here's our daily traffic pattern. It's got that. Uh, sine wave kind of <laughs> look to it of the, as users are awake and on campus, traffic goes up, traffic comes down, um, some spikes. Uh, you know, it'll also track other things like the VPN or any connect VPN client usage. See that change during business hours each day. And then uh, we occasionally, when we don't have an easy way to collect it as an interface stat, you know, we can have similar for errors and drops and things like that uh, for different devices, memory, CPU uh, for all the devices, uh, temperature, um, you know, it, it grabs anything you can grab with an SNMP. They're very opinionated at ACIPS about SNMP. So anything you can grab with SNMP, they will grab. They don't do SFlow. They're very opinionated about that. Uh, so, uh, and they, they um, so, uh, as long as you can get it with SNP, you can get it into AKIPS. And then, uh, but here's one where our homegrown tool, as it's going out and talking to all the devices every five minutes for the monitoring, we have it collect information in, from a lot of devices on network connections. And one of the things it collects is from the wireless controllers, how many users do we have for each SSID? So that gets put into a log that ends up in Splunk. And so we can take a look uh, and make a Splunk report from these logs from our homegrown NMS that show us, yeah, here's how our user traffic is each day. And this is the kind of thing that Cisco Prime Infrastructure or DNAC or whatever the current Cisco tool is that does it. But that's another case where we had Prime Infrastructure for a number of years. And we said, you know what, for what we're paying, as we grow the number of devices, the price of that tool keeps going up and up. We can we can do some improvements, get some contract developers on our homegrown system. And for the price of support for one year of Prime, we can write a tool that gets a, the kind of 2% of the features of Prime infrastructure that are really important to us. And then after that, uh, we're not having to pay that ongoing maintenance to Cisco. So what we found with a lot of the vendor provided tools is they, they just, they, they try to meet so many needs, but they aren't needs that we have. There's probably a, a customer out there that asks for every feature that's in it, but we only use two to 5% of the features. So this was a case where we, you know, we'll just go out and collect this data ourselves. We're not gonna pay the license for the vendor provided tool in that case, especially when they scale with the, uh, number of devices that just doesn't end up penciling out for us at the number of devices we have and the, and the budget we have. So this is a case where we were able to combine our homegrown tool and Splunk's graphing ability to, to give a nice graph that is similar to what you would get from a vendor provided wireless connection tool. And then uh, another tool that I really like for planning purposes, our security team really wants, you know, forensic kind of all the packets account for everything that's going on on the network, every byte, every packet. But for planning purposes, for network monitoring purposes, um, doing the historical reporting off of flow data, it, I, I like these tools like Inmon Traffic Sentinel that they can take NetFlow, they can take IP fix, they can take SFlow, statistical flow, but they convert it all to a statistical sampling. One, uh, so you don't account for every byte. It's an estimated total volume and estimated total packets, but the traffic, uh, the storage needs for this and the processing needs, when you crunch it down to a statistical sample approach for flow data, 
it performs much faster. It takes much less data to store it all. We can keep a year of flow data and be able to do reports on it in a very timely fashion with uh, Inmon Traffic Sentinel. And Inmon does have some free versions of their tool as well. This is one that we pay an annual support for. But uh, here's a case where I was just trying to think of something as I was putting the slides together. I thought, okay, let's, let's take a look. You know, the kind of thing you can do is say, hey, I want to know which DNS servers we're using, public DNS servers we're using. So I made a search string where I said in this where clause here, I want to know total bytes and I want a table that has IP source and the source port. And I want to know that you know, the source port, you know, this is responses coming back to me uh, from port 53, either TC, well, I meant it to be TCP or UDP. I see here I did a typo and it's, it's just UDP, which would explain why all of my stuff is only UDP. So I, I made a mistake in my report, but I, you know, what I wanted to see was TCP and UDP because I wanted to get an idea of how much of it is TCP and UDP, but I, I, I didn't catch that until now. But anyway, I can say, yeah, I want from these sources. And then, you know, I don't want to see any of the traffic. This is our on-prem private address space and public address space. I keep clicking. Uh, I, I don't want to see any anything sourced from our DNS servers or on campus. And I want to see, and I don't want to see anything destined to that's just a response from a public DNS server to one of our DNS servers. And that was kind of a long list. So I just put in the placeholder for that but it was kind of interesting to see yeah no no big surprise you know uh probably 80 percent of the traffic's all going to google's 8.8.8.8 some to open dns uh, the secondary google server the cloud 1.1.1 is cloudflare much much lower on the list uh, so anyway that is and uh quad nine is is very low not not a big uptake for our campus on people using it but anyway that gives you the kind of thing where you want to dig in oh go ahead how have you found the uh, documentation on Imon and what the uh, learning curve on it uh, the documentation is is good uh but not great so they have a lot that's pre-documented. They have a good community out there too. So you know, you once you have a license, you can get in, you can ask questions, or and they they take questions that they've answered and they make it available as knowledge base. But the other thing is the 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 guys that invented. Here's my sales pitch. I'm an old HP guy, and the guys that invented uh, SFlow uh, came from HP Labs. And these guys that run Inmon are old HP Labs guy. They got HP to license the technology, let them take it out, run their own company. So the guys that are supporting you are the guys that invented SFlow, and they're very. They've been very responsive for us. Anytime we have an issue uh, and have a question, trying to work, you know, hey, how would I even help how would I attack here's what I want to do I'm not sure how to do it with this tool you know, I, they will give you a help and ideas for it they might even have a script they'll share with you of oh we've helped another customer with this here's a script that we don't put on our website but you you might find it as a useful starting point so they've been uh, super responsive that way thank you it's also on unix based and so there's some things if you if you have the skill set and want to dive in you can kind of write additional tools to, to augment what you want to do going direct to the, you know, running directly on the same Unix server as the system. And, uh, you know, the other thing I've found, uh, you know, some people, they really want to get the NetFlow data and all the bytes and packets. Uh, AKIPS will do that. AKIPS will take in NetFlow. So that's another tool that will take it in. But I just... Uh, one, once you start having, you know, if you had a year's worth of NetFlow data in AKIPS, it gets slow. In any tool, almost any tool I've used, it gets slow. It gets bogged down when you got a lot of history in it if you're not doing a sampled approach. Uh, so it's great, you know, and we more look at AKIPS for like 30 days of data to, to have more detailed record, more detailed accounting. But for network management purposes, general trends, you know, the other way I use this is, uh, like DNS, part of the reason I showed this was we were having trouble with people getting their machines getting hijacked and going to a malicious DNS server. So 
about eight, 10 years ago, we decided, hey, what if we blocked all but these kind of well-managed public DNS servers and say, you can't use the DNS, default DNS protocols to anybody else outside the university. So we could use these reports to say, you know, because you're always worried, well, who are we going to break? Who's depending on this? How would we notify them? You can use this type of report to say, oh, well, you know, only we only have 150 devices using DNS and 90% of those are using the well-known public DNSs. So if we permit those public DNSs, there's only going to be 20 servers that would be impacted because they're using maybe their home, you know, some ISPs DNS that we don't want to permit through our firewall. Um, so we just, we know the list of the 20 servers we need to contact. We have their email contacts for those systems. We, we start communicating with them. In three months, we are going to turn DNS off. You're not going to be able to use the DNS server that you're host is currently using. So it's it's a great tool for that too, where you can answer questions like, well, if we make this change, who would it break? And once we know who it would break and if we think it's the right change to make, now we know who to communicate with. All right, I'm gonna go to the next one. This is the performance phase. Uh, and these are the end-to-end -end measures and the best end-to-end -end measure uh, and the great news is it's a it's an open source tool is smoke ping. We, it's simple yet effective. It has some issues scaling up because we love it so much we just we have uh, I forgot to count but we probably have 150 destinations that we're doing smoke ping to. Uh, but it's great you know we can use it and like I talked about you know, there's kind of two main things you're looking at with performance. Well, three main, and smoke can get you two of those, response time and packet loss. The third one is throughput, and I'll talk about that next. But for smoke ping, you get response time and packet loss all together here. So uh, we can see things like we had an SFP failure for our primary connection on the Coeur d'Alene campus last weekend. So Saturday, little afternoon, right about lunchtime, that SFP failed. And fortunately at that location, we do have a backup ISP path, but it's a much higher latency. So it was very obvious that, oh, we're on the backup path now because that latency went up. The interesting thing is, see all this blue here? We'd been having a low grade kind of half a percent packet loss. Here's your average packet loss. So Something wasn't hasn't been totally happy with this for several days uh, leading up to this. Then it, the primary path failed, so the latency went up. But look at that! You know the the uh, it's all green. We're not seeing this half a percent of packet loss. Then we replaced the SFP on the iron side of the connection, and our link came back up and stayed up, but it uh, we're still getting that 0.5% packet loss. And now that we're looking at it and after that failure, we said, well, let's, let's go in and replace the SFP on our side uh, of the router. And so that's what happened here with this little outage. We, we were upgrade, we had already planned to be there to upgrade the uh, software um, Monday night. So we also replaced the SFP and look at that. It's green after that. We got rid of that half a percent of packet loss. So this is one where no users were complaining. We, you know, it wasn't above the threshold that we alert on and took took more immediate action. But once we saw it, it's like, oh, you know, we're already doing maintenance. Yeah, we're having some issue with this link. Let's replace the SFPs on both sides, clean the fiber on both sides. Now we've got a clean connection again. So this is, uh, yeah, it's not true end to end. You know, this is a smoke ping server sitting centrally located uh, yeah, on connected to our core network in Moscow, but it, and it's pinging out to the router uh, management interface in Coeur d'Alene. So it's, it's not true end to end of user to user, but you know, it, it gives a campus to campus visibility end to end. And we've got a service provider in this case, iron in the path. And we can see end, end to end from one campus to the other 
what's happening. And then the other thing we do on the Moscow campus is we have a lot of our key servers that we ping as well. So there are kind of end servers that a lot of people go to. So we're not only pinging to remote locations, but we're also pinging right here on campus where we can see what the performance is from that server to, to key services. Um, the other thing that I thought was a useful one here is we've moved our ERP out to Oracle Cloud. So here's a case where we're doing site-to-site -site VPN to services in Oracle Cloud, and we have users going to services hosted in Oracle Cloud. So we monitor this. This is one of our public load balancers in Oracle Cloud. And here's the 12-month view. We often lose our history here when we, if we're not careful when we do upgrades with Smoke Ping, we when we upgrade the smoke ping uh, application or server, we'll lose our history. So we only have three months of data here, but there was a major routing change that happened between us and Oracle Cloud. Our data, our systems are hosted in a data center in Phoenix. We're routing th through two, two uh, intermediate service providers. You know, so we have Iron, Typically, we're preferring going out through Zayo, and then there might be another provider in the path before we get to Oracle Cloud. So something between us and Oracle wasn't anything changed in Iron. It wasn't anything changed on our campuses, but or, you know, Oracle Cloud just got 30 milliseconds closer to us because of some internet routing changes that happen. But that's a way if people, if it happened in the reverse where it suddenly went up and we were getting users complaining, we could take a look at this and say, oh, well, yeah, I can see where you might see more of a impact on performance of trans file transfers and things to Oracle Cloud because you know we had a 50% increase in latency to that location. In this case, we'd say, hey, you know, the latency just went down, you know, you should you should be seeing better performance, not worse, you know. So that's just a couple examples of what we like with, with Smoke Ping. So all of our software as a services and any cloud services, we have Smoke Pings going to them. Things that kind of representative of types of services students use, we, you know, I, I don't keep it totally current and up to date, but we have stuff like YouTube and Twitter and and uh, Twitch and you know other public services that we just pick an IP address there just to get a sense of what's our response time to the outside world as well as it's great because we have a statewide network that runs on top of iron it's great for monitoring that and any other kind of key partners research partners that we work with we monitor to them also And then uh, I'll move on. The last slide here is for throughput. There, there aren't a lot of great tools that I've found for monitoring throughput because really to, you're either making an estimate or you're, you're putting load on the network and you kind of hate to put load on the network. But for the researchers, they've the research community and Energy Science Network has come up with this uh, tool called Perf Sonar, and uh, you know, so it's open source. It's something you can, well, I don't, uh, you know, install and run. Uh, no licensing required. Uh, there's a lot of good documentation. I forgot to include the URL here, uh, but if you look up uh, just a Google search for faster data at ESnet. Um, they have a website called Faster Data, and they just have a ton of useful information for how to improve throughput of big file transfers. But this tool has been great. It is it is kind of a, it requires serious care and feeding. You know, the Smoke Ping server, we've had some issues scaling it. There's some optimization we had to do, and then it largely just runs. Personar seems to be like there's always something going wrong with the Personar server. So I just warn you, you know, for those of us, you know, that are supporting researchers, you know, we have to invest the time and energy into it. Um, and we have found some, there's some things it can find that none of the, our other tools will find. But I want to warn you that, yeah, don't just go into it uh, thinking it's just going to run forever once you set it up. It's the kind of thing that gets uh, frequent updates. It gets into a bad state. It'll run itself out of memory, and it doesn't doesn't recover well from those things. But uh, what it is good for is it sends big bursts, you know, of 
traffic um, and it's really telling, can you fill your pipe? And what the researchers want to know, hey, yeah, you know, our research, we were told we have a 10 gig connection. In this case, this is between, we, we set up monitors between all kinds of locations where researchers are collaborating. And it'll tell you on average what your upload and download throughput speed is and tell you your latency and packet loss. But uh, what they, you know, what the researchers want to know, yeah, we, we thought we had a 10 gig network, but I'm, you know, if I'm only getting one gig, hey, you know, there's something wrong with this path. Or if I'm only getting five gig, I want to know why I'm not getting the capacity I need, because I need to move this research data around, you know, at, and I've got large data sets to move around is what they're driven by. So you can see where here's one where packet loss, we experienced heavy packet loss and we had a decrease in throughput in the reverse direction at that same time. So there are things that, and there are types of packet loss that are detected with this because it sends a big flow of data and it, it'll, you, we'll see those spikes in our AKIPS graphs on the internet. They're short, but intense but they will find, they, they send a microburst of data out and they will find equipment out there that's in the carrier that has, you know, it's failing, it has a chip problem, a buffering problem, but you will never detect it with smoke ping because smoke ping is just sending a few small 64 byte pings, uh, maybe five at a time. You're never gonna detect it, but when you send a heavy amount of traffic, actual loading of the network, from one persona server to another, that's where you'll see, oh, we're getting, every time we set up a big transfer, we're getting packet loss because one, you know, we're, there's some device in there that doesn't have enough buffer or is a card that's failing that mostly works except when it's under load. And so we've been able to work with Iron and say, hey, we're seeing this. Iron works with their provider, you know, for some equipment and it might be a, you know, a century link or Iseo has to send a technician out. Oh yeah, we've got a card that is failing, but not down and we need to swap it out and, and fix it. So it's definitely helped with those kind of things. So now I'm, I'm ready uh, to take questions or uh, if you, or discuss anything, or if you'd like to see a specific tool in more detail of, hey, show us what this looks like live. Uh, I'm, you know, we've got a little, little more time here, 10, 15 minutes. No one wants to be the first person to ask something. What did I leave out? How about that? Does anybody, or I, I think I see some hands moving. So yeah, speak, go ahead. MRTG, uh, how does that compare to Perf Sonar, MRTG? How does MRTG compare to Perf Sonar? Yeah. It's been a while since I've used MRTG. I thought it's graphing, isn't it just graphing interface stats or is it generating traffic? Uh, it, it doesn't generate its own, it does monitor throughput. Uh, yeah. So, so Perf will generate that burst to simulate a load where uh, most other monitoring tools just can monitor what's happening, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, like MRTG was what we had before we went to StatSeeker and then AKIPS. So, it's great for showing you what the devices, the, your routers, your switches see and the throughput they see on their interfaces. What per, the difference with Persona is it's generating traffic. Now it's putting a load on your network and it makes, you know, it's, it's a kind of an ongoing uh, t tug of war between the, re <laughs> the universities and Iron because Iron is saying, you guys, are, this Persona data isn't doing any useful work. It's just loading our network. And we say, yeah, and you know, we acknowledge that, but it, it is getting us data we can't get any other way in terms of characterizing how the network's performing. So we try to be judicious about it. We're not generating a continuous, you know, if we generated a continuous eight gig stream, you know, 24 seven, you know, that that's just using bandwidth for no good purpose, but we do targeted, you know, 20 seconds, put a heavy throughput through, see how much of the 10 gig pipe we can fill. 
And that awesome. will show up in an MRTG graph on the on your internet interface or on your I2 interface. But Persona is actually generating the traffic and collecting the data on the other side of I sent, I know I sent, tried to send 10 gig, I only got eight gig on the other side. What's the frequency that you're doing the 20 second burst? It, it, we do it, it, it's configurable. So we do it maybe four times a day, eight times a day, you know, depending on the researcher and how, you know, how many data points we need, but we try to try to spread it out where it's, it's in very infrequent. The, the other thing for any given pair of destinations, uh, we were doing four times, six times a day, but we are doing eight different destinations. And so is BSU, so is ISU. And so we, uh, those all add up. So, you know, it, it doesn't seem, it's not a lot of data points to make a nice graph, but it, it basically what we're doing is just that sanity check that we want to know within, you know, a, a working day, hey, we've, we're starting to see a problem and detect a problem here. What made you decide on 20 seconds? Oh, you know, I think you need enough time for the speed to ramp up, but it wasn't a real strong, uh, I don't have a strong like formula for how long it should be. We tried to keep cranking it down to where we could fill, fill a 10 gig pipe, but not, you know, but not go any, if we went shorter, it wouldn't really regularly fill the pipe. I think was our kind of, it was more of a empirical approach of how short can we make it and still get the useful data we, we need. And, you know, and we were just trying to be, it was part of our negotiation with iron too, of does that seem reasonable? Does it, you know, can you live with that? How big of an impact would that have on other people's traffic? But yeah, I don't, there might be papers or something written where people have studied that and have a better answer, but I, I don't have a, a more empirical answer for you on that one. Uh, now I made the group picture bigger so I can kind of, can't quite see faces. I can see a few faces. I recognize a few faces there too now. <laughs> Other questions, other things you'd like to see? Any other tools? That was the other thing I was gonna say. I, I see some folks there that I know have some other tools that they might be using for monitoring. Any other tools that you think are worth an honorable mention that we may not be using here, but you like? Don't be bashful. I couldn't hear you, but people. Uh, we use Libra NMS at, at Voice of State for Evaluation. Right. Is that Robert? Yeah. Okay. I thought I read. <laughs> and where did it fit? Was it the alerting? Yeah, we moved our alerting off from, we were doing the most part of alerting for Prime. And also for storage, it's with Yeah, we we have the 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 luxury or the option of this homegrown network management tool that's almost thirty years old now, and it's just been always carried forward within the network team, uh, and developed and improved over time. But yeah, if if you don't have that to rely on, that. Is that an open source as well, Robert? So you, yes, the is. price is right on that. <laughs> I think that we had a support license, but it was really expensive. Okay. Anybody else want to offer a tool? Any other end to end? You know, I'm always looking for those end to end measurement tools. I spend a little time. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, looking at uh, Thousand Eyes 
because I hear all these ads for Thousand Eyes and, you know, they've got these agents and it's, you know, you're going to need this when everybody's working from home. So you can tell if it's their home network or the ISP or your network when they're having performance problems. I, I did a lot of, I did, you know, a week or two of kind of off and on at the beginning of the pandemic, playing around with it, installing agents, you know, it, one, it took, it was kind of, it kind of reminded me of persona more with like, wow, this, this is going to take a lot of care and feeding to get tuned right and, and keep it useful and, and managing well. And so I, and it was once the free pandemic license was over, it was, you know, it wouldn't be something we could afford to put on every user's desktop. You know, I would like something like that, you know, that could be a, on every user's desktop, uh, you know, we could have that end-to-end -end performance. Um, Smoke Ping's been a good compromise from our server to kind of any point in the network. I've, I've heard from other universities, they like to, uh, I think it was Penn State said, they put a Smoke Ping server in every data closet. So they have a Smoke Ping server in every data closet, you know, kind of pinging to central location. So they can say from a data closet, you know, what's our, you know, end-to-end -to, -end to that level. Um, and then there was another research project that they said they're not ready for prime time yet, but uh, they were at, I can't, I'm blanking on the university, but they've been doing uh, a Raspberry Pi version of a, of a monitoring node that would uh, connect. It's like, perf and they were calling it Persona for Wi-Fi. And so they're putting kind of Persona like functionality in a Raspberry Pi that you could put anywhere, you know, either ad hoc or have regularly spread around and it scans for SSIDs. It says what the signal strength is. And if the if it has credentials for that SSID, it's a known SSID and it has a good signal, it would connect to it and do th throughput tests on it. So they said, and that's a tough problem. I, and they, they definitely said like, they've been working on it for a couple of years and they, they're not ready to release it into the wild yet. But, uh, and now you, nobody, the big question was, how do you get Raspberry Pis? And they said, we don't know. We were hoping somebody else knew how to get them, but right now, because of the supply chain. But, you know, there are people working on this. It would be better. I, you know, I would love to see a better, more end-to-end -end test. But writing those agents that are on every server, that's kind of a, that's a tough game. You've got to really have a high-touch, you know, white glove support type individual that you need to monitor that laptop and know that that laptop's okay, you know, and having good performance. But I, yeah, we didn't go down the thousand eyes route or the agent route. I, I'm intrigued with this Raspberry Pi work that uh, is being on an NSF funded grant that I think, you know, maybe someday that'll be ready or it'd be great. We did send uh, some smoke ping servers down like to Boise. We were having some issues at the water center building in Boise. So we shipped some smoke ping servers down there, put them in different subnets as a troubleshooting tool kind of, but it'd be great if we just had a Raspberry Pi, we could send down, do the same kind of thing or place one. Yeah, you know, it'd be inexpensive enough. We could place one at every site or every building. Well, I think we've got a 10 minute break. I'm, I'm happy to give, give the time back to the group uh, to have a little break before the next session.